Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another RebelWay webinar. My name is Urban Bredesco, and I'll be your host for this evening. With us today is the awesome Yuri Bryan, currently the senior FXCD at ILM London, previously head of effects at Important Looking Pirates in Stockholm. Yuri has been working in the industry for 10 years as an FXTD. Pretty much all of the, uh, his time spent was working with water. So you guys know he's uh, an expert with water effects. Uh, spending five of those 10 years working as an FX supervisor across movies and television. Yuri, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here and it's uh, really nice seeing so many people here uh, willing to spend a few minutes with us. Awesome. Well, I'm, I, I think it's going to be worth, uh, worth their while. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> uh, so, right. So let's, um, uh, we're going to be jumping into what Yuri has to show for us today, right after we showcase the advanced water effects promo. So let's roll it. Yes. Yes. I think that's one of the best looking promos uh, we ever did. Did awesome job on, on everything. You. I mean, uh, thank you to Saber and the team at Rebel Wave for actually making it look cool. I just did the sense. So uh, yeah, well, it's a team effort. Today. It's always a team effort. Very true. There's, there's, there's no other way. <laughs> very, very true. Yeah. With all of that being said, uh, Yuri, uh, Go ahead. It's all, it's all you, man. <laughs> cool. Uh, so I guess I'll share my screen. Do it. So I thought it's always nice to get to know each other a little bit. So let's start with actually talking a bit about my career while you guys see my show reel. Um, I've started my journey in visual effects quite young, I would say, uh, when I was visiting my family in the States and my cousin was animating. I forgot how the website is called, but it's one of those where you can animate the a path for a little guy on a sled and he's sliding around and it's this flash animation stuff. <laughs> and we got really into that and did more and more flash animation together and um, cut forward two years. He's starting down his path in the animation world and doing 3D animation and now game animation. And I started with visual effects. At 18, I decided that high school is a bit boring and I know what I want to do with life. So I dropped out of high school got yes. accepted into Vancouver Film School and uh, moved to Vancouver. Uh, did Vancouver Film School, which was very nice because, you know, you learn a lot and you meet amazing people. But I always knew I want to do effects. And I was a 19 year old, quite cocky guy who says, hey, I can do water effects. And nobody hired me. <laughs> I couldn't get a job because <laughs> I couldn't show show reel. Right yeah. back then. That's like, what, 10 years ago now. Um, God, there wasn't that much training out there, especially mm. for the more high end stuff that you can really market to a studio and say, Hey, give me a job. Now, after a few months of trying to find a job, um, I got contacts with a studio in Vietnam through a friend and started working for them, started bidding for them, commercials, movies, all of that. And we won a project. And that project was quite big. So the company owner said, come over and run the project for us. So a week later, I moved to Ho Chi Minh City and stayed there for three to four months and worked on that project. Sadly, financial crisis was a thing back then. So mm. all the investors uh, kind of pulled out and the studio shut down, right? Things oh, happen. Man. It's crazy. And uh, the crazy thing is I had to move 
back and move in with my parents and all of that and try to do any job and anything I could in the meantime, just trying to learn more, polish up my skills until in December, I got an email from ILP in Stockholm and I interviewed with them and a few minutes later, well, an hour after the, <laughs> like, it was like 30 minutes interview and they asked me, when can you start? And I'm like, yeah, Monday. And that was <laughs> on a Wednesday, the interview. And they just kind of laughed at like, ah, find a place first, all of that. So I'm like, okay, I'll find a place and I'll let you know when I can be in Stockholm. And I, on Thursday evening, I called them, said like, so Monday, what time? And I started Monday right away and started working on commercials with them, not on water, but uh, doing a like Super Bowl commercial for Fox, mm. which those are always crazy. Uh, yeah. But we did that and uh, I was struggling, right? Young artists trying to do some cool stuff with an amazing team, but just working, working a lot. But over time, I got the chance to work on some water shots, uh, showed that I can do some cool stuff, worked on a majority of shows. And after being at LP for about a year, I got asked to lead the team. And uh, back then that was, well, two people <laughs> and uh, so I was leading myself and another artist and over the next like three, four years, the team slowly grew from like two to four and then five. And we were taking on more and more projects that were all bigger scopes, right? So the shot count just went up and up and up and up. And after about five years, I kind of ran the department, supervised and worked on all the shows and all of that. And uh, eventually, once the company was big enough to have heads of departments and all of that, I became the head of effects and effects supervisor and worked a lot on that kind of stuff, right? Just management while doing shots, while managing the team and trying to build things and make things better, all of that. But earlier this year, I kind of decided that, hey, it's time to do something new. I'm turning 29, been here for a while and I want to learn more, right? Grow more as an artist myself. So I decided to send out some applications and happily for me, ILM uh, wanted me. So I moved to London earlier uh, in September and I'm working here now uh, just for almost, yeah, just over two months now as an effects TD for the London team and having a blast so far. Awesome. That's pretty much my career. It's just a bunch of hard work and, um, having an absolute blast working with some of the best artists in the world who thank God are all amazing lighters. Um, cause I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they can make my stuff look actually really nice and really cool. Um, yeah. that's my career. Love it, dude. I love it. It, I have a question because you, I feel like you kind of did both and now you're working on movies. What is like for people learning, you know, or, not, maybe not just like beginners, but just people that are kind of getting into the industry. Is it better to start working at a company that does commercials or movies? Like what is better for learning? Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. So if you work in a movie company, in my opinion, you're exposed to a lot more higher end stuff, right? So mm -hmm. the, the quality they push you to is very, very high, obviously. And you have a lot more time to actually achieve that quality but you also have a lot of very senior people to learn from, which is always great. And you have a lot of amazing tools that have been written for you, right? So a lot of those easy things, those easy mistakes, they're all taken out of the equation just because, well, a big studio can't afford that. If you're working on 500 shots simultaneously, you can't do the little mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always thought when I was hiring for LP that I want somebody with big, picture experience who learned and came up from the commercial world. Mm -hmm. And that is just because you don't have these safety nets. You have four weeks to do a commercial of two minutes full CG. Yeah. Right. And it's just crazy. And taking somebody from that environment and then putting them into the TV environment, which is crazy, but way less crazy than commercial, they're going to be fine. Right. All of a sudden it's like, no, you don't have two days to figure out that shot. You have two weeks Yeah, and they're going to be happy, right? They're going to do cool stuff and they're going to be amazing. But at the same time, if you take somebody who's used to having this whole support network and is used to 
having pretty much a lot of time to deal with it and like a lot of people to lean on and a lot of software and a lot of pipeline stuff and all of that. If you then take them into an environment that's basically here's the software, bare bones, there's import and export. That's all you have from the pipe. And yes, you have one a senior artist as your mentor, but they also have 20 shots to deliver. So yeah, it's difficult. It's it's harder for people to step in. And at LP, we always said like coming in as a senior from a movie studio is rough. The first mm -hmm. six months are rough just because of the amount of stuff you're responsible for. Um, yeah. And I feel most commercial studios, most TV studios are a lot more that way than movie studios are. Yeah, the pace is way different. But yeah. uh, just from my experience, I feel like if you want to learn, like to be fast and good, like doing commercials can be very, very educational. And then obviously, if you like, like you said, transitioning to movies at uh, ILM, they give you some more space to breathe. And yeah. then, <laughs> but you you already have the knowledge to work fast, so you can do faster iterations. So you know, it's always a good skill to have. Exactly. And I feel also like the biggest thing I feel in visual effects is communication, right? Mm. We always say, oh, it's a team sport. It's a team sport. It needs everybody to work together to do something great. Yeah. Well, you can't do something great if everybody's on a different page. Yes. Right. And in the movie world, because it's so big, the communication is a lot more bottlenecked than a lot of studios, right? It's streamlined through certain people, which means as a junior effects artist, the amount of chances you have to actually talk to a comper about the issues they're having comping your effects is yeah. very limited. Uh, some yeah. studios don't allow you to talk across exactly. departments. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in the commercial world, you're sitting next to your lighter, you're sitting next <laughs> to your comper, exactly. and they're going to tell you, hey, fix your stuff. Yeah. And then you fix it and yes. you know what's up. Exactly. And that communication skill is something that takes years to really perfect right and mm. get it down to a nuance of like hey i know this is going to be an issue for the next department so i'm going to fix it in five minutes without having to talk to them because i know it will be a thing yeah and that skill a lot of juniors have when they come out of a commercial shop but from a movie shop they kind of know like well if my animation doesn't work i talk to my lead and that's mm. like that's not how smaller studios work that's not how commercials work that's not how tv works yeah. Well, cool, man. I have a bunch of more questions, but we'll do them later <laughs> after your, uh, I think it's best if we just jump into the, the, yeah. the meat, the meat the and meat. potatoes. <laughs> I thought it would be fun to start this whole thing off with actually showing the first water clip I've ever done in a production. Yes. It was for ILP. Um, let me just mute that. It's actually funnily enough for the Swedish military, uh, the Swedish military does a lot of advertisements that are very elaborate every year, not as crazy as the US Marine one. But you know, if you got to advertise for your Navy, why not flood an office? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of showing like it's not just the usual office job. Uh, yeah. So this is actually the first water shot I've ever worked on. Bunch of old school Houdini flip stuff. I think Houdini 12 just came out when we did this. And it's all rendered in V-Ray and most of this plate, like the boxes are fake and the water is yeah. fake. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a fun little shot to show where it started. Still looks good. <laughs> it kind of holds up. Ish. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from that, I think we should go to one of the projects I think most people kind of know my work from, and that's really Lost in Space. Mm. Um, Lost in Space was a crazy project. Um, we did water-wise, we did a lot of work, a lot of volumetric work and a lot of crazy detailed fire and all of that. But relevant for this is this waterfall that we did. And the thing is, it was a weird brief from the client. They basically came to us before they had the script written. So they came to us and said like, hey, here's the first few drafts of the script we want to do a water planet and have some crazy stuff in there. We're kind of thinking maybe having a massive waterfall. Mm -hmm. And the supervisor at ILP, uh, Nicholas um, Jakobsen, sat down with our concept artist, and they came up with a bunch of crazy ideas, one of them being this massive, uh, so 
So like just an equator of waterfalls. Yeah. Right. So that is just nuts. <laughs> and the thing is, because we didn't know what we're going to do yet, what are the shots layout, any of this wasn't anywhere decided. We actually decided very early on that we would build an environment where we can just plug in a camera and it renders. And mm -hmm. no matter where we put the camera, it'll hold up. The resolution will be good enough. And then we can just film it. And what we ended up doing then is build a one kilometer waterfall, <laughs> uh, which is actually not as long as it seems when you have to cover an equator. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, we made the environment loopable. So the environment could just be stuck next to each other and all the rocks, all the on the water environment, everything will line up perfectly, which means you can line up the water perfectly, hmm. right? So a shot like this, uh, right? All of this water is just repeating. And if you really look for it, you can kind of see the tiling. Um, but we basically simulated one kilometer and it starts here and then goes all the way to the edge. That's one simulation. That's mm -hmm. all one sim done at once. We used um, distributed simulations for that, which were crazy. Um, those sims alone took like 750 hours on two 96 core machines and took 750 gigs of RAM <laughs> just because we didn't know where to put a camera. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we needed some resolution in this. Yeah. I think I simulated one kilometer at 0 0.02 uh, pixel uh, particle separation, which is like a few. All, all, everything. That's everything. like all, all the particles. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it was a lot. It was, uh, I think, in total, one version of the waterfall with all the secondaries and everything came up to about uh, 600 terabytes of storage. <laughs> and that is compressed. So how um, do you how do you work with that in the viewport? Like in you don't, the, you don't, you don't. Right? Um, yeah. Funnily enough, because we had well, I come from a very luxurious place at LP where we have unbelievably good lighters. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually got in a very bad habit of never looking at simulations. Uh, I had too much to do, so I just simmed stuff check that every system worked on a five meter square and then hit export. And three days later, we saw the renders and um, they normally worked out. So this <laughs> waterfall, for example, the top layer, so the crazy sim, I'm pretty sure this is version two hmm. of the sim. Um, and that's basically just laying out a bunch of mega scan rocks and then running a sim. Yeah. Now, when you look very closely on the static ones here, you can kind of see a transition line right here, right? Where it's like mm -hmm. just a bit brighter. And that is because we have actually four simulations in each one of these. We mm -hmm. have the top layer, which you can kind of see over here, but this stuff falling down is actually not in that simulation because that would be way too heavy. So what we did is just simulate the top chunk of the waterfall until it falls down. And then you just cut away the edge, make that the emitter for a new simulation, at which point you don't care about all the tiles on the left and right of this. And you can just emit water from it, run an airfield simulation, and then render all of that as whitewater. So this stuff here, the whitewater is actually the same flip sim as these mesh chunks here. Mm -hmm. It's just we isolated them so we get a little bit of meshing falling over the edge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that way you actually end up with a top sim that's crazy heavy, but that crazy heavy sim actually dictates all the other simulations. Mm -hmm. So once you have that and that looks cool, you can just say, well, throw it into the waterfall, let it drop, add some foam to it, and then send it over to light. Now, because this is crazy heavy, <laughs> uh, we could obviously not render a kilometer of this. Like there's just not enough RAM to actually fit all of this high res into the system, onto the machines. Yep. So we had to export this whole waterfall three times uh, just so we could have an auto loading system that just switches these guys out based on the camera. And as we do a flyover, they slowly switch in the decks, uh, distance. Mm -hmm. And that way we can kind of get some detail. Now that was crazy. And like these kind of shots are all nuts and all of that. 
But one of the craziest, in my opinion, is actually this guy. I call it the most expensive background ever. That's blurred. <laughs> At least <laughs> LP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's 500 terabytes of storage. And yeah. <laughs> about uh, yeah, a month of sim for that background. But it looks that's crazy. Good. So looks good. That's nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you think it would be cheaper to just go shoot a river, like no. shoot a plate, put it in the background? <laughs> no, I don't. I actually don't think so. Just because they always want changes. Right? Oh, that's right. And yeah. as soon as they make changes, it's kind of broken. And I, I really like the way we at LP had a chance to work with the guys from Lost in Space because yeah. they trust us so much. Yeah. Um, if they would have, if they wouldn't have trusted us to actually be able to pull this off they might have gone and shot footage for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a month before finals, they might have changed their mind. And then we yeah, yeah. had to build this. A bunch but, of problems, yeah. Yeah, the way it was is like, we knew what we're getting into. They knew what they're getting into. We had a very open conversation with them. It's like, hey, iterations take ages. So let's just figure this out. We got some help from side effects to really optimize the stuff and they, you know, suggested linking RAM buses to the CPU cores and all of that so oh, okay. that we could actually sim this efficiently. And uh, yeah, I think we got a pretty cool sim out of it in the end and a very happy client. Yeah. And also a VES nomination, uh, which sadly went to uh, Stranger Things <laughs> for a really good cool creature. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do think this is one of the best looking water sims I've ever saw. And in theory, you're going to be showing how to do this, right, in the workshop. Yes. So basically, what you guys are going to learn the last two weeks with me is waterfalls. And you're going to learn every single cheat, every single trick, everything I've used to do these sims. Um, lighting and all of that, I'm not going to cover because, again, I'm <laughs> the worst lighter you can imagine. But you're going to learn how to do, like, this shot. Like you can set that up and run it uh, yourself, yeah. Afterwards, and you'll know every trick, everything that we use for this. And the nice part with all of this stuff is that actually it's not insane. Like there is nothing. Like the complicated stuff with doing these kind of things, in my opinion, is always the concept, like grasping the initial idea of how can we get to that detail level uh, reliably, mm -hmm. and then once you have that the systems and the actual Houdini side of things is actually, it's feasible. It's not where you're like, oh, I need a physics de degree for this and we need to code stuff and we need to write our own solvers to make this possible. It's just mm -hmm. using the tools that are there in an efficient way and driving simulations in a very controllable way so that you can really go like, well, if I place a rock here, right? Like if you look at a sim like this, they clients will want to art direct where white water goes. So, well, running the sim will take a month. Uh, you can't do that. But if mm. you build systems, if you build everything correctly, you can just place a rock and you know what will happen. You can say, hey, they want a comma area here. Okay. I move my rocks around and I know I'll get a comma area here. And yeah. that kind of predictionary thinking, that's what really makes this stuff complicated. But building it, um, everybody will hopefully afterwards go like, oh, okay, that's actually not crazy. And I can use this stuff in my daily work mm -hmm. um, relatively straightforward. Yeah, because like I see a few people are asking, how much RAM is this taking? And then somebody was, was saying, oh, we don't have 500 ter terabytes of storage. Like, it's well, funny, like Yuri is going to show you guys how to do this on, on a budget. <laughs> exactly. And you yeah. always got to think, you probably don't have to do a kilometer of this, Yeah. right? Like if you want to do a kilometer of this, like, okay, <laughs> you know, you might, you might have to go to the shops. Mm. Um, but if you want to do a waterfall, you'll be fine. Right. Yeah. It needs a lot less Ram than 500. Also, if you know what you're sh like, as always with effects, right. Stuff gets really expensive. If you don't know what your camera is going to be. Exactly. Cause then you have to do everything for any and everything, right. Oh, yeah. we might be super close. So I need all the resolution. But if you know what your camera is going to be, and if you kind of keep yourself limited in just not going the most epic scale ever, 
yeah. um, and rather focus on showing off good technique, showing off good, you know, shapes, good motion, getting all of that nailed down. Um, it's going to be way more beneficial for getting hired and learning stuff than saying like, well, here's a massive sim that took me a month to sim. It's like, that's cool. But, you know, can we see some details of it? It's like, no, look how big it is. Nobody's going to be impressed by that. Yeah, right? exactly. I think what's impressive about this is just that not the fact that it's long. What's impressive is that we can put the camera anywhere and that these shots work without having to tweak a lot on the simulation end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so RAM and all that should be okay. As long as you have like 32 gigs of RAM, um, you should be okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. So from Lost in Space, let's actually go over to another fun project, which was one of the first few projects where I was like full on lead of a bigger team than two. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is The Shallows. Uh, Shallows is this uh, little surfer shark horror movie um, came out a few years ago, and we did a bunch of shark interactions for it. And um, they were all really my first approach of like, hey, we need to get stuff into an ocean that is not just a boat in the ocean, but like actual full on ocean interaction and all of that close to the camera and quite high res. Um, and we did this with a team of uh, three three additional artists. And I think it looks really good. In my opinion, this is still some of the best white water we've ever done. Yep. Um, the reason for that is uh, the lighting soup. Uh, Bobo Skipper is an insanely good artist. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, for this shot, which I think is the best white water I've ever produced. Yep. Um, it's all mesh. We just meshed it in <laughs> like an insane resolution and V-Ray is amazing. So mm. uh, we rendered this with SSS and V-Ray. So good. Dude, and it, it, it looks a like a, it looks like a real play. Yeah. And that's, Honestly. that's the thing. Like Bobo just doing his magic is unbelievable and it, it works and it's, it just looks good. <laughs> and uh, the nice part is like, you know, motion wise and all of that, we could kind of match the plate. Uh, really cool stuff that we actually did for this is um, the client filmed this tank, right? So this is just a massive tank that maybe expands five more meters on the sides here. And they put a wave tank in it, right? So you have like mm. the walls on the sides moving and building all of these waves. And we kind of wanted to match those waves so that we can actually match them, you know, on our shark and all the interaction on. Now, the thing is, if you just put down an ocean uh, descriptor for this, you can kind of dial it in, but this modularity of like just the waves being hit from the side constantly is a really hard thing to match. So we had uh, one of our match move guys uh, actually rotoed um, and drew lines, curves, and then animated them by frame to kind of match the overall motion of the water. <laughs> uh, you know, like, oh, this wave coming in here, like that timing is really hard to do with an ocean yeah. modifier. Yeah. So we just drew a curve and animated mm -hmm. that guy coming in. And mm -hmm. then I used those curves to inject velocities and to drive and um, to ramp up oceans to then actually get all the motion to relatively line up, right? It's not perfect. Yeah. But it's a hell of a lot closer than if we would have just said, well, there's no ocean or here's a yeah. random spectrum that works on a few frames, right? Yes. So here it's actually moving with the actual plate that they shot in a yes. thing. So yeah, yes. it, it helps a lot. Yeah. It helps a lot. And the same thing here, right? If we had like big waves coming in, we try to match those a little bit. And uh, then it's just a lot of resolution. Back then we didn't have those crazy simulation machines at LP. So we just mm. ranked the rest up as far as we could and render this guy. And the nice part is here, like, for example, I think this shark looks fantastic in the water. Yeah. And that's mainly, again, the lighters being fantastic and doing really nice little tricks that are super underutilized. Like here, we took the shark that is modeled and looking cool. And then we duplicate the mesh, displaced it, and just put a water shader on it. Mm. And instead of shading your shark and tweaking specularities and tweaking like your diffuse maps and all of that to get it like, ooh, it looks wet now. Well, if you just refract it, 
through water, it'll look like it's in water and all the specularities mm. will behave correctly. All the roughnesses will behave correctly. And then you put a little bit of displacement on it. So all this water here on the nose, right? It looks like it's running off. That's just yeah. a displacement. That's procedural. And shark looks wet. Just like that, right? It's, yeah. it's relatively cheap. Well, cheap artist time-wise. Mm -hmm. And um, you get some really cool stuff from it. So that's the shallows, which is uh, a fun project. It was a tough one, but uh, yeah, we pulled it off, I think. And here is also where the inspiration for the shark shot comes from, right? So the shark shot that we're doing in the um, week five, uh, week four, yeah, week four yeah. of uh, the workshop is uh, this guy. It's inspired by that. And uh, you're going to learn all the methods, everything that I used to do this shot. So all, all of this stuff, you'll be able to do the same kind of work, right? Same kind of methods. And then it's just dialing it in and getting cool animation to make this stuff work. After this guy, uh, let's talk about another project that we're going to do. And that is one of them. This is actually going to be in week two. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about custom ways of doing flip simulation, custom sourcing, making flips stick without having to use a lot of viscosity and stuff like that. And what we're doing is a very, very simple effect on screen, but a rather complicated effect when you work on it, which is mm -hmm. we have a character and it's raining like hell. Yeah. So we can't just put a dinosaur in here. We need to have all the rain interact with this dinosaur, right? So we need sprays coming off the dinosaur we need streams of water falling down we need streams on the skin that like move around and collect and do all of the nice things and you barely see it in a lot of those shots which is yeah. kind of sad yeah but if it's not there you right like these sense. little droplets falling off all of that all yeah. of these little impacts that halo of rain around him you'll never ever buy the shot yeah right uh, so we're going to spend like a little bit on like how to set something like this up and how to build something like this. And I think just to under for understanding water and different flip issues and all of this, um, it's going to be quite nice. Yeah. Now these shots are just kind of cool and kind of epic. Um, yeah. but they're kind of simple. Uh, it's just cool animation and a big flip sim. What we will cover is how to make like white water this throffy and this mm -hmm. much white mm -hmm. water. Um, we'll cover that when we talk about beach breaks in week five. And it's that's just a fun little little thing to do. It and... looks so good. Yeah, the dinosaur like with the and the raindrops. It's exactly what you said. If they're almost invisible, but most the best effects usually are, right? Yeah. Which is which is kind of sad. But at the same time, if nobody notices your work, it's kind yes. of the highest compliment. <laughs> yes. If people say like, oh, wait, you did something on that shot. It's like, yes. Yeah. Yes. You. Give me an Oscar right now. It's like, just, <laughs> just give it. Like I had this weird obsession in uh, school, in Vancouver film school of trying to talk my professor into letting me do a shot of a single raindrop running down uh, plate footage, like yeah. just filming somebody and then making a raindrop just yeah. to show like, hmm. Look, it's it's fully integrated. You don't see it. Yeah. They didn't let me, which was <laughs> <laughs> too bad. <laughs> too bad. You know, it's it's a really really big shame. And uh, lastly, from projects, before we jump into the, like some more of the stuff you learn in the course, uh, one thing I'd like to show is just the latest water project I did at ILP myself. Effect uh, supervised it, did a few shots on it, uh, which is Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Legacy. Um, Netflix superhero movie, and we were given a storm sequence in the beginning. So open oceans and a lot of boat interactions in storms. And mm -hmm. this stuff is always fun and it's always super challenging to do um, just because the resolution is crazy and you have like dialogue shots. I think there's like 60 dialogue shots of them just standing on deck like this yeah. and now populate this and make it look good and have yeah, it like yeah continuity travel through and all of that stuff. That's just always insane. And then like doing shots like this is just always fun and uh, dealing with wakes and all of that is, uh, yeah, that's always a nice challenge. Um, so just wanted to show off some of the 
uh, crazy shots. And a lot of this water work is actually done by, well, now my old team at LP, um, mm. by a bunch of young effects guys who joined me straight out of school or like right after their first job and uh, learned from me and worked with me for a while. And um, they do shots like this and they look great. It's amazing. Do you guys, is the ship animated or is it actually floating on the water? So we have a, com like LP has a completely custom open ocean um, mm. tool set for like building the surfaces. And with that, we also have Houdini setups that take animation and then just put it on the boats. Uh -huh. But you always have to animate, right? Like if mm. you would just do a linear animation of a boat moving, you won't get the drops. You won't get that hang time at the lip of a wave and all of that stuff. So there's definitely additional animation in here. Um, but yeah, just the micro wobbles and all of that kind of comes with the tool set. And then there's yeah. a lot of animation on top, obviously. But yeah, yeah, like some of the stuff we'll cover, like some of the approaches to this kind of stuff um, we'll cover when we talk about the maelstrom and gravity warping and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, for example, none of this is using guided simulations. None of this is using the pre-made whitewater tools. Like this is basically if you have Houdini 12, you can do these shots. Mm -hmm. um, they'll be a bit more expensive because you don't have narrow band. But besides that, this is, um, you know, uh, as most of the work at LP, for example, this whitewater here, that's a custom whitewater solver that I'll teach you how to write in week three. Mm. Um, there is nothing here that's really like, oh, side effects presets or side effects tools, um, which I think makes these shots look better and they make them feel less generic. I feel like a lot of the whitewater stuff nowadays, you can really tell which version of the whitewater solver was used for that. Um, so that is really some of the main projects I wanted to share with you guys um, that I've done and worked on and supervised over the last few years. And uh, some of the crazy, amazing work done by the lighters and other effects artists at LP. It's uh, just fantastic people. And yeah, great work from them. Yeah. Yeah, dude. It looks so good. I love it. I all, like everything you showed us here is like top quality for sure. Thank you. Um, Shall we talk a little bit about one of the cooler things, in my opinion, that we'll teach in the course? Yes, do it. Um, that is actually airfield simulations. Now, airfield sims are not really in Houdini as of now, but obviously you need to do them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a sim like this. And yeah, it's a sim, right? Kind of high res sim, just water. But the supervisor kind of says, like, eh, it doesn't really feel like, like a nice splash. Uh, it's very stringy, right? All of that stuff. How can we actually turn this into a cool sim without, well, spending five months tweaking velocities and all of that? Mm -hmm. So what we can do with this is turn it into this, which gives you a lot more of the soft air yeah. feeling to everything. It makes it feel a lot more natural as it breaks, right? You get these hanging particles right away that a lot of people would associate, <clears throat> sorry, associate with a white water sim or mist simulation. Yeah. Um, the thing is, this is all 100% flip. There's not one additional sim in here, nothing. And this is, for example, the same approach, the same ideas as are used for the waterfalls. Mm -hmm. It's just, how do I get in, right? Water, is kind of simulated in this vacuum of like, oh, there's no wind in here, there's no air friction, it's just gravity, and then your water simulation. Yeah, this allows you to just say, turn on a button and turn on this air friction so that you get this really nice peeling effect of your particles getting pulled away. And like yes. bigger masses of water, they just stick together, they hold together. And the smaller they get, the more they frail out, the more they break up and they just hang in the air nicely and fall at a different speed than the big masses of water. Um, so that's a really neat little thing to just have in your arsenal. And I thought it would be kind of nice to show you guys the Houdini setup for this. Yes. So this is actually very different than, I, than any of the courses I will be holding, like any of the workshop tutorials. Uh, I'll just walk you guys through the scene of how I did this. 
effect and slower res. But in the workshop itself, I never have a scene file where I just go like, here's the scene file and let's go through. We, all the stuff you'll learn, all the projects we're building step them by step. together. Well, yep. and we built them together yeah. right away, right? So it's nothing like, oh, I'll just copy parameters over or anything like that. It's just, let's build all the nodes. Let's test all the things together. Let's debug things together if something goes wrong. Um, so let's say we have this sim, right? And it's low res at the moment, and we want to turn it into something a bit more natural looking. The only thing you have to do, and the only thing you have to think about is that variable density in Houdini is a thing. And to turn that on, all you have to go is to volume motion to density, and then just check the density by attribute option. And that allows Houdini now to distinguish between different densities, right? So think about oil floating on top of water. That's just because the oil has a lower density than water. So it'll always try to come on top. Now water has a density of 1000. Air has a density of zero. So mm -hmm. if we just add particles around our water with a density of zero, it'll look like your water is moving in air. Pretty simple concept, Yeah. pretty easy to do. Uh, <laughs> to actually build this, it's a bit more complicated, not crazy. But you basically do all of that in a sub solver, which allows you to have the sub context inside of dot networks. Mm. So you can just build tools, you can build systems that use all the tools you're familiar with without having to deal with all the gas micro solvers and all of that stuff. So if we go in here, all it is, is basically a stream that splits out. Basically, I kill all the water. So I split out the, uh, here's only water that gets turned into a new surface field because obviously as soon as you have air particles in there, the flipped surface field, you can just throw that out of the window. That's useless because that will encompass all the water particles, mm -hmm. but the edge of the water is air, right? So you need to build a new one. We just make this guy bigger, fill it with particles and then kill all the particles that we just generated that are inside of the water. Mm. And this way we get this nice little cocoon yep. of, uh, water around everything right so if we simulate a few frames here we can see that we get this new shell particles generated right here mm -hmm. right? that just happens on the first round and those particles they're air particles and that's just done by grabbing all the water and then turning it into the shell of particles now if we had particles all over the place this would obviously not work right because then we have particles underneath here, which makes bubbles, and we have particles back here, which slows down the water, all of that. So all of the rest of the system is basically cleaning stuff up and like making sure the shell is only in the places where we want it to be. Mm -hmm. And this stuff, again, like all of the stuff I'm going to teach is crazy simple. It's the concept and like the higher level approach to things that really make this stuff work. If I would just ask you guys, oh, just put a shell of air around this thing, you'll be good. <laughs> you know, like actually building this stuff is not, it's not crazy complicated. It's also not the easiest thing in the world. And linking things together, making sure, you know, the resolution, so whatever you change, you get the right amount of voxels filled with air around it, or let's say, you know, when it collides, do I need to take into consideration that if my particles collide with, right, for example, here, this water comes and collides with the rock. Now, if you're not careful, you have air particles here that mm -hmm. you don't see in this play blast. Now, they will obviously collide with the rock first, and also mm -hmm. it feels like your rock has a force field around it. So they will just you know, you need to clean this stuff up or, hey, these particles hang here in the air and you have one particle all the way up here that now has a box of other particles around <laughs> it, increasing your simulation time and all of that stuff, right? So it's not just building like the idea of like, oh, let's drop in variable density, we're done, bye. But how do we clean this up? How do we link this stuff up? And how do we make this really production ready where we can say, hey, this works and it's scalable and I can say, it worked on a rock, so let's drop it into a beach. And it works. Yeah. And how can we make this stuff scalable and approachable 
and nice. And that's really all the course is about, like high level concepts that allow you to do very low level stuff. That's really easy once you break it down. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like once you know, Hey, this is, this is how I can build airfields. You can build airfields and you're done, right? You can always add an airfield to something, but if you don't understand why certain steps are necessary or why certain methods work and certain methods don't, um, and somebody asks you like, Hey, this splash looks a bit CG looks a bit fake. Can we add a bit more realism to it? Your first initial approach won't ever be this technically simple approach. Mm -hmm. right? My goal as an artist is always, I shouldn't take longer than eight hours to have all elements for my mm -hmm. supervisor mm -hmm. of work and thinking a certain way, approaching things as like smaller systems that link together and build something great rather than like, oh, I need to build this big, massive system, breaking them down into smaller, easy to build chunks will always lead to the best results. And yeah. the nice part is once you build them correctly, you can change and do whatever you want, right? If a supervisor comes now and says, oh, can we have a second rock in here? Or can we have a guy walking through this? The system doesn't care. It's all built and it's all fully accepting of the fact that anything and everything can change. The only variable this cares about is I need a cocoon of air particles around my water particles. So it does that and nothing else. Yeah. And you can use this for waterfalls and for other techniques as well, right? For it's ju like, just going to work. This exact same system is what's used for waterfalls. Uh, there's some different like cleanup required, right? Maybe you want an area where the water falls faster than others and slower, or you want water to be more concise, right? Less of that breakup at the top and then more breakup at the bottom. So you add layers of control, but the core principle again, is pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the same thing if like, oh, we need to do beach breaks and we need these really nice throughing waves, this. But the only difference is now we select where we introduce it, right? We don't just put it on all the water, but we add layers of control of where, where do we want that throth? Where do we want that breakup? Um, same thing like the underwater bubbles um, in the shark, they utilize, for example, variable density and different approaches of how to control this and to really, yeah, really be in charge of what the simulation does. And it's just all Lego bricks in my mind, right? You just build a system that's just a normal Lego brick. And then if I use that Lego brick today to build a fire station and tomorrow to build a Star Destroyer, it doesn't matter. The Lego yeah. brick's the same and it just links into the systems and uh, you get your results from there. Yeah. And I feel like all of these techniques are so important to art direct your simulations yes. because I think a lot of time people have problems or issues they don't know how to art direct stuff. You know, like you said, they, 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 they create a tank and they put some water in it. You get a water sim, but then you, your supervisor comes in and he's like, oh, I'm not super happy with the water sim. And if you're unexperienced, you're going to be like, yeah, but that's how the water, like that's how Houdini does water. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really true. Like you can, if, when you get to know all of these uh, techniques, you can start art directing uh, yes. water, fire, destruction, uh, and then uh, magic as well. Like all of these and techniques are. Like you said, it's a brick, right? It's kind of a tool set that you can then reuse in other uh, areas with Houdini and your FX. Yeah. yeah, and like just to emphasize how crazy this is, I think 99% of all the effects I do, if it's water, magic, smoke, uh, rigid bodies, they all use these methods. Yeah. And not just like, oh, I take an airfield approach and I apply it to smoke. It's like, no, they use water sims. Mm. Like I solve 90% of my work with water. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, you got to do clouds, boom, water. Water. That's going to be a water cloud. <laughs> I, I, once we had to do for childhood's end, we had to do a spaceship coming through clouds. Yeah. Oh, that's a water sim. That's just a tank and the boat, like air spacecraft pushing through the water. And then you just convert that into a VDB and use the rest attributes to add noise to it. And there you go. High risk clouds that wrap around a ship and look cool. Whereas a smoke simulation with the spurs or like 
would go way too early, right? And get way too <laughs> way far away from the ship. All right. Dude, that's crazy. Water. That's crazy to use waters for, for, for clouds. So yeah. you want a sand tornado? There you go. It's a water sun. Water. Yeah. Uh, and you and want magic. Water. Magic as well, right? Yeah. If you look at all the Harry Potter magical, you know, when Voldemort and Harry are clashing, it's that's just, just water. Just water. <laughs> yeah. Like the biggest mistake I see when people show like, oh, I made a cool flamethrower. Yeah. Their source is not water. Exactly. Yeah. Because like, it's gasoline. It's that's gasoline. spraying. Yes. And 99% of the time, it's just a sphere that emits a lot of velocity. And a lot that's of velo not what yeah. a flamethrower yeah. does. If you look exactly. at any footage, it's a line and then things go up and that's your fire. The fire yeah. doesn't push forward, right? That's why you'd never get enough detail exactly. in it. That's exactly. why it looks weird and shredded. Just do a water sim, set it on fire. Yeah. And uh, you're good. <laughs> it's it's so, really so, that easy. So what you're saying is that in this workshop, people will learn how to do flamethrowers, uh, clouds, water clouds, and, <laughs> and magic. <laughs> like legitimately the way I'm emitting water, like again, I'm not using any of the side effects tools just mm -hmm. because of layers of predictability and mm -hmm. the way you need to see things in my opinion um that's the same way i do destruction it's this exact same method and i literally explain it on the hands of destruction of like hey let's mm -hmm. blow up this torus and predict where all the pieces go cool let's switch that to a flip sim and there you go we can predict how the first few frames look all right like my goal has always been that this industry is crazy with the amount of work we have to do, the, fa the how fast we have to do turnarounds, it's just nuts. Yeah. So if you're a good artist, you can kick off your shots on a Friday afternoon and you can go home and have a weekend. And people who aren't in the industry won't really appreciate that because yeah. especially with Sims, if you kick off a Sim and that thing takes 30 hours, if you're wrong, Mm. You have 10 people without anything to do on Monday. Yes. 10 people without anything to do. That's, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars for the company. Yeah. That probably means that Thursday delivery is not going to happen. So now you have to explain things to the client side supervisor. If that happens too often, your studio loses trust with the clients. And, ooh, right? Uh, that's all of a sudden a lot of pressure every artist has on their shoulder, even at low levels, right? Yeah. More so actually at the junior level, because we're artists and we're perfectionists, most of us, and uh, most of the pressure comes from our own mind, right? So my goal has always been build systems where you know what's going to happen, right? I never ever want to kick off a whitewater sim and not know where I will get how many particles. Mm -hmm. I never ever want to kick off a splash sim and not be able to look at the first frame without ha ever having to simulate a frame. Mm -hmm. Like I can just visualize that in the viewport and I will know exactly how that first frame will look. And then I hit sim and it adds a bit more detail to it and continues from there, right? But I can really sculpt all my work. I can predict all my work. And if you can't do that, you're going to have a lot of rough weekends because mm -hmm you'll have to go in and check your sims, right? Do they look good? Do they not look good? And if you don't do that, right, either, you know, your delivery schedule is just going to be kind of messed up. And I think we put all a lot of pressure on ourselves through that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, the more we know of how to look at things at complicated effects, simply, and really add a base level the more free weekends we have, right? Yeah. That, that's just how it is. The more, the more times we can actually leave the studio at 6 p.m. and not at 8 because mm. we had to wait for the first 10 frames of the sim and make sure that it works and doesn't run out of RAM, right? Um, all of those things are super, super necessary. So a big part, like every time we start a new little project, we're actually spending the first video, like that's like 20 to 30 minutes normally on not doing any effects. We're mm -hmm. not opening Houdini. What we do instead is um, we're going to like a website with like 3D. It's kind of like an open whiteboard and you can just dump stuff in and dump images directly from Google. You can dump YouTube links, all of that stuff. And we're doing shot breakdowns, mm. which means breaking down all the elements we assume as an effects artist, the supervisor wants to see. 
Mm -hmm. And then we're going to order them in the with their dependencies, right? What do we need first? Also considering what do other departments need first? And then how do we actually talk to a supervisor about these things and get this stuff signed up before you open Houdini? Because it's a million times better to spend two hours of your day getting full approval on your simulations, getting that all like that. That's all the elements we do. And then doing those, then it is like, hey, I'll just hop into Houdini and I build my water sim. I spend one and a half days on it. I show it. And now the super goes like, well, that's actually not what I had in my mind. Mm -hmm. And now you just waste the time. You put more pressure on yourself, right? You, you put yeah. more layers of, oh, shit, on, on your own shoulders that you just yeah. don't have to. And that comes back down to the communication, right? I think a lot of... A lot of bigger studios, for example, they, they tell you which parts you have to do as a junior. Whereas yeah. the commercial studios, like, fill this glass with water and some ice cubes. You have two yeah. days. Bye. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Don't, don't screw up. <laughs> don't screw up. <laughs> Show us to render tomorrow morning. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Clients expecting a version in six hours. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's really what I'm trying to focus on with the course. It's like, how can we make things that look complex, that look really high end, that are high end, but make them seem simple. Mm. Like if I do my job right, you guys will go like, oh, that wasn't that hard. Yeah. And then you turn around and you do something that you couldn't do before. Yeah. Like if, if that's the result, then I did a good job. Yeah, and I love it, love it. So good, I feel like you should do <laughs> another workshop just talking about production and how to because because you have a lot of experience obviously leading supervising projects right i feel like that's a very important skill uh for juniors mid-level or high level artists to 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 have a proper time time management right yes because that's gonna probably save you a lot of those uh crazy late hours uh, in the studio if you know that it's not just the artistry but it's the discipline that you have to learn that comes yes. uh, together. So I feel like you should do uh, like a bonus uh, tutorial or something oh, talk, just talking about that. <laughs> I think the workshop's going to be a lot longer than the 25 hours we advertised. I think <laughs> it's, it's quite a lot right now just because I, I talk a lot about these concepts and those ideas yeah. and while building the scenes and showing you guys how to do all of that. Yeah. But I definitely agree, like the biggest Right, that LP, I always used to say, I promote somebody to a mid-level or a senior, hmm. not depending on what shots they output, but mm -hmm. on how much of my attention they need. Yeah. Because you can do the best shots ever, but if you need two hours of my time a day, you're not a mid-level. Mm. You're, you're, you know how to do cool stuff, but you need a lot of input. You need yeah. a lot of feedback and technical help and all of that. And at the same time, you can do pretty cool looking shots, but relatively slowly. And you're a senior because I can tell you here's a shot and I can trust 100% that I'll get that shot on time. Mm. Yeah. And to be able to do that, it's not experience with Houdini. Like a lot of people learning things through workshops, the schools nowadays are amazing. You know, the technical stuff, the stuff people don't get is the approaches. How do I communicate? How do I break things down? How do I work with things that are actually in a correct dependency, right? Like what does my lighter need before the other elements? Mm -hmm. like, do I, do I need to do a whitewater pass on the first thing and then refine it? Yeah, probably. So they can start shading it and comp can start comping it. And then you just update the sim and everybody hits render and it looks decent, right? Instead yeah. of hogging all your things until it looks cool. And then you had render in the right lighting environment and you see your mesh doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and now you start fixing, right? Like all of those kind of approaches, all those ideas, they are really what distinguishes artists in their yeah. levels and their qualities. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would a hundred percent agree. Uh, well, cool, man. We're almost running out of time, but I, I do have a few questions. Absolutely. Um, so learning and teaching like when you started how did you learn what was because back then there was no rebel way right no. we we are making things a lot easier for people uh, by bringing like you know industry 
uh, like senior people like yourself to teach because that knowledge is so valuable and we're trying to give it to the people so they can, so they can, <laughs> you know, uh, don't have to work super late or have some uh, yeah. free weekends. So how did you start learning and how do you see, uh, you know, how teaching or well, learning and education was then versus how it is today? Well, that's the biggest difference, right? You have actual industry professionals talking about stuff. You yeah. don't have people who are good at stuff working at home, teaching most of the work, right? You have guys mm -hmm. who and girls who work 10 hours a day in production and then go home and are so passionate about what they know that they spend another two, three hours teaching people. Yeah. And that is unbelievable. I mean, Jesus, like that right? is a resource. Yeah. That's just, I love it. It's stuff. so good. Yeah. Um, I mean, no other industry really does that besides arts, right? Like you yeah. wouldn't expect like a chemist construction to, workers to do a workshop on how to construct, yeah. <laughs> even like, though that would be a cool workshop. It would be an amazing workshop. <laughs> I would go in an instant, but yeah. you know, you don't have doctors working in a hospital all day and then going to university and teaching. They take yeah. the day off and do that. Yeah. Um, most of the people nowadays don't do that. They, they just do it as a side gig, which is fantastic for all the students. Um, the way it was for me back then is, um, Vancouver film school didn't teach Houdini. I tried to convince them a few times. They shut that down real quick. Um, yeah. so I actually spend about six hours a day after school, which in Vancouver film school, that's, uh, one year of education, which means mm -hmm. you have 10 hours a day of classes plus homework. And then I spend another few hours a day, uh, reading documentation and just mm -hmm. going through note by note and just from a through set, putting down every single note in the side effects documentation and see what the hell it does. Yeah. Spend way too much time on odd force and just asking yeah, dumb yeah, yeah. questions and downloading every setup I could get. Yes. My smoke systems are. I like what I learned about smoke. I learned from a guy called Bunker on Odd Force. <laughs> like, uh, he has this weird scene file called Volcano.01, which shows a custom way of doing uh, smoke cooling down on an ash cloud. It's fantastic. Yeah. Everything I know about vorticals comes from him. Um, so, doing that, and then the only way of getting industry insight was spending every minute I could, every walk from home to school, every bike ride, every time in the gym, uh, listening to FX guide, um, uh, podcast and yeah. their videos that they're outputting that they used to output a lot, uh, which is just a bunch of supervisors talking about the shots and how they mm -hmm. did it. Right. Like the mailstorm, for example, that we'll learn how to do that method actually allows you not to simulate a mailstorm. Yeah. You simulate a flat simulation that then gets deformed and just looks like it's a simulation where everything is falling down. Yeah. which means your tank is one meter high compared to 20 meter highs, which yeah. means you can change the shape. Like, Ooh, we would just want to make this like a little bit different. Cool. Change it. We don't have to reset. Yeah. yeah. So that is, whole method. Is that, how, is that how they did the pirates of the Caribbean one as well? Right? Exactly. Like yeah. that whole method, nobody ever showed me how to do it, but I re like when I was like, Oh, that would be a cool thing. I remembered how, um, that effects guy podcast. Oh, mm -hmm. where the soup mentioned that in like a three minute bit. It's like, oh, that's a cool idea. Let's see if I can do that. Mm. And, uh, ends up. Yeah, that it works. works. And it's actually really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just a lot of, a lot of time spent, uh, listening to every little tidbit you can get from anywhere and everywhere. Right. Um, so it was a lot more cumbersome. It was a lot more time intensive and the worst part is you learn horrible habits. Mm. Like if you teach yourself that way, like you'll have to spend about half the time you learn learning stuff mm. to unlearn stuff mm -hmm. like, Ooh, I can do this with smoke and that'll be cool. And then you go into a production work and they're like, don't do that ever. It's yeah. horribly inefficient. It's way better to just sim it five times the resolutions. Like, Oh, but like I can introduce a lot more rest into my sim using like dual rest fields and doing this cool stuff. And then we can take yeah, it yeah. in comp. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Or it can just sim two hours longer and we hit render and it looks good. Yeah. Like, cause you just said, uh, oh, those two hours of sim 
are more worth money wise and time wise mm -hmm. than four hours for your comper and lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that does make sense, mm -hmm. right? So all these habits, all those things where you're like obsessing about how cool it is, if you're in your own little bubble, they're useless. <laughs> um, so learning directly from a professional is just way better. Yep, every time. And learning in production is also quite important, I feel. Yes. So, uh, that's what we're trying to do here with WebAway, get people, well, to educate some senior people as well, because not everybody is specialized in water, right? People are coming from, you have senior people that are specialized in pyro and they want to learn water, they would take a wor workshop like this. Uh, which is also one of the questions I had, is it better to be specialized versus being like just a generalist? Is it, is it going to help you in the end? Well, it depends, right? Effects artists, you will be typecast. That's just, mm -hmm. if you're good with fire, they'll give you fire shots. Yeah. If yeah. you're good with water, you'll get water shots. So you might start out not being specialized, but you'll be specialized in a degree. Right. I think I'm way too specialized in a sense. Like I mainly do water. Yeah. So if somebody gives me magic shots, it takes me longer to do than other people just because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh shit, this is not my traditional water. Um, but as an effects artist nowadays, you do everything and anything, and then you might have like a heavy focus on one thing. Right. So yeah. you might be like the smoke guy for the smaller studio, but that doesn't mean when they need destruction when they need magic effects you'll still do them but probably 60 percent of your shots are going to be kind of angled to the thing you do best but every manager i've ever worked with they every you have at least one meeting every six months with your managers right and they just go do you feel type cost do you want to do something else what are you interested in learning yeah you know like oh like i told my guys at lms like, i love water if you have some destruction, I'm shit at it, but I'd love to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're like, cool. So we'll give you water shots with a little bit of destruction in it. <laughs> right. And that's cool. Uh, yeah. So I get to learn new stuff. Yes. And that's how most uh, supervisors operate and leads operate. It's like, hey, you're good at this, but what do you want to do? Right. Because we don't just want to type cost people. Yeah, exactly. I feel like in a way, so if you are specialized, it's going to be easier because you will know exactly you you're going to know everything about water right for instance mm. and that way you will kind of uh, work faster yeah you know? exactly so, and so they that's know that. that's a and that's a good thing but yeah. after a while i feel like you get bored <laughs> by just doing water so you do want to jump into other areas occasionally like, but that's and, just me <laughs> yeah and i mean like i always thought and looked at things like if you're the best at what you do at one place you're probably in the wrong place yeah right like we're yes. all too young none of us are 65 and like oh i'm gonna retire next year i just want to <laughs> exactly make all the money in the world for the next two years and just be the king of this thing at a place um if you're in a place where you're not learning things you're probably in the wrong place yeah and that means if they only make you do one thing and you're not learning new things, but there's not new challenges attached to that and new, new other problems that you have to solve around it. It's probably time to go. And, um, being typecast is one of those things, right? Like they're going to give you shots you're good at. And if you're good with fire, you're going to get fire shots. If you're good with water, you're going to get fire, water shots, but they know that people don't want that. So being very good at the thing will help you get a job for the studio that has that need right mm -hmm. and that that needs to be clear if you show your show reel and it has all smoke on it and you get a job it's not going to be to do water shots you're gonna get that job to do more smoke yeah <laughs> and yeah once yeah. that gig is done and they like you they might ask you hey what do you want to do next mm -hmm. um but whatever you show in your show reel you'll get hired by a studio that has that specific need yeah so if you want to have a wide range of stuff that's very high end your chance of, of getting more jobs is definitely higher than if you say I'm super specialized on water. Like that's my, yeah. that was my show reel, super specialized straight out of school. Took me a year to get a job, right? I just knew I didn't want to do anything else. So yeah. I, I, I was in a position where I could wait, but 
right? If you just want a job, you better show a lot of different stuff. Yeah. And I feel like if you are going to do that, and I hope we're kind of moving into an area about show reels now, yeah. I feel like if you are going to show a lot of things, just have the quality consistent, yes. uh, because if you have amazing water, but then you put some very shitty pyro stuff or destruction that doesn't look good. And it's just from a tutorial, it's better to leave it away yes. until it's good enough. So it, you, you put it yes. into a consistent quality because that will just tell people that you don't know, you cannot differentiate the qualities. <laughs> and uh, it's not even that like as a recruiter, you look at it and go like, well, okay. The water looks cool. Yeah. That, is that just a tutorial now? Yes. Yeah. The fire doesn't look good. Exactly. So I don't trust that they can actually do it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's the trust. Uh, yeah. Like if you have a very short show reel showing only amazing stuff, if you have a show reel that shows everything grayscale, that's a million times better than showing stuff badly lit and badly shaded. Because now I go like, ah, no artistic eye. Yeah. Like even if it's a sim show reel, if it looks bad, it looks bad. And it all plays together, right? But if I see a water sim that's grayscale and it's cool water, I'll probably go like, well, at least they know what they're good at yeah. and call them in for an interview because they have that judgment. They have that. I trust them to be able to make that call of saying, Hey, this works or this doesn't work. Yep, exactly. There's a few more questions and then, then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, there was a good one. You were mentioning, uh, remapping CPU to Ram buses. Uh, is, is there any freaking knowledge or resource on that? <laughs> you no idea, especially the way we did it will not apply to anybody else. Yeah. Right. It's all custom. It all has to do with your render managers, your system, like, like all of that kind of stuff actually scares me like hell, like building mm -hmm. a computer. I'm like, Oh, which parts work with which part and where's yeah. the freaking flow yeah. sheet. <laughs> it's horrible. So no, I have no idea. I just know, uh, Eric Hermelin, our then, uh, CTO did that and it worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I know about it. Yeah. Cause that's a complete different. <laughs> area um, of yeah. expertise, usually yeah. IT people handle yeah. all that and super yeah. technicals. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh, how do we manage the data center? It's like, I don't know. I, I just know I put data out there and they, they do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when it comes to rendering, shading and compositing, uh, I believe for this workshop, Sabre is gonna yes. run uh, through that and show you guys how to, uh, how to actually shade and comp you know, all of the shots that you see in the promo. So, uh, yes, uh, we're going to be covering that because that's an essential part of uh, producing that quality, right? Like yeah. uh, Yuri was saying, a lot of times you are kind of depending on your team to, but it, it's the other, it goes both ways. You can't, you have to know what you're delivering to them and you, you have to know that they're going to take it to the next level, but it, you know, you kind of need to know their process and vice versa for this to work. So exactly. yes, it, it is a very important process. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's it from me. I, I think Caleb, if you're listening, I guess we can play the promo one last time and then we're going to say goodbye. Looks so good every time. It's such a nice promo. Yeah. Uh, so are people asking where is the volcano zero zero one file? Uh, yeah, Jeff uh, Jeff Wagner, I think, uh, posted it. The old school chef from SideFX. He knows where the good stuff is.
Oh yeah, I need to. I need to see that as well. It's it's <laughs> it's literally just a sphere with a bunch of microsolvers and uh, particle scattering systems, and it just nest. I don't actually know if it still works. You might have to find an old Houdini version for yeah. some of those stuff stuff to work. But yeah, it's uh, it's really nice. Wait, is Jeff actually in the chat? Yeah, Jeff's in the chat. Oh damn! And he actually oh. posted the link to the uh, odd force topic. Oh. And uh, yeah, then you just have to search for volcano on a score zero zero one dot set, and you'll get it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you're hired to be our chat uh, <laughs> chat specialist for now on. <laughs> and he even offers to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a that's a really nice file for people who want to get into microsolvers for smoke. It's a, it's a little little sphere rising as a master class. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. I mean, uh, we show a bunch of that how to do it in our workshops, but yeah, because I was meaning to ask you like, where is that file? I need to open it up. <laughs> and I mean, again, it's the same thing of like, right? You see the file and you like, oh, this is how it works technically. But if you don't yeah. have those explanations of why it works, why those approaches, what are the goals with certain systems, then actually applying it on a different topic is a lot, lot harder to do. Right. It's it's everything we talked about. Like you can read the forums and learn stuff from it, but doesn't mean you get it and doesn't mean you can apply it to other things. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh Yuri, thank you again for this. It's been a, an amazing chat. Uh but yeah, thank you, Yuri. Thank you uh for being with us. Uh Jeff, thank you for being in the chat as well. <laughs> <laughs> super, super cool to to see uh, industry people like uh, of that status. <laughs> listening to us yeah. uh but yeah dude uh let's let's do more webinars it's gonna be <laughs> let's it, do it. it yeah but yeah the workshop is starting soon it's gonna be awesome i can't wait to see it and uh yuri i i feel like you're gonna do an amazing job teaching it so yeah i, I think people are gonna enjoy it and uh yeah i'm really really looking forward to getting to meet all the people in discord and to see the cool stuff you guys do with it awesome well, sweet. That's 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 it for us. Uh, it's been we've been talking for like an hour and a half now. Uh, see you soon with a new webinar. All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.